Good afternoon. Thank you very, very much for coming. Um, really appreciate it. I'm going to be presenting today on ideal classmates and reciprocal idealizing through critical participatory looping in socially intelligent dynamic systems. The first part was in the title, so you didn't get scared away by the second part. <laughs> and so, but it's really, really simple concepts, and it's very, very useful for classrooms uh, teaching. And um, I need to thank also my Tokyo research group, um, Tetsuya Fukuda and Yoshifumi Fukada and Joseph Fallet, who contributed to this, a lot of the studies that you're going to, I'm going to be explaining to you, okay? Um, I like doing warm-ups. I don't really do uh, lectures so much. I do workshops. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to do a few activities in order to break the ice. Is that okay? Will you play along with me? If you will, please, okay? So the first one is a speed dictation. And it's actually what I do with my students all the time in order to make sure they have a pen out and some paper. So you need a pen and paper, <laughs> if you have one. And if you don't, I can loan you one. <laughs> and to loan you a piece of paper. And I say a phrase very, very quickly. And the idea is that I say it so quickly you can't get it all. And you have to help each other, okay? You have to help each other. All right? So are you ready with this phrase? Yes? If you, yeah. If you want to go ahead and collaborate with the person beside you and say, you get the first half, I'll get the second half, you might, that might help. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so do you have any problems with students not getting paper and pen out? <laughs> yeah. OK. Here it goes. You ready? Collaboratively energizing my imagination. Great. And you can help with your partners, cheat, look, ask your partner if you got it all. Okay. Help each other, help each other. <laughs> You can't read your writing. OK. And we're going to be playing with this speed dictation routine. Uh, it turns into a routine because I'm going to make it into a dialogue. And every five or 10 minutes during my presentation, I'm going to be asking you to ask your partner, what are you doing now? And you're going to have to say, oh, I'm collaboratively energizing my imagination with you. OK? <laughs> With you. So you have to add on I'm and with you at the end. Okay? So could you ask your partners, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? <laughs> okay. I also give my students five strategies, which I probably won't give to you completely. Um, basically, chunking, and we go through it, and then back formation, which works really well. And rhythm, we tap on it, and we say collaboratively energizing my imagination to get into their heads. And then we actually sing it. And you probably all know the song. Could you sing with me? Yes? It goes like this. Collaboratively energizing my imagination. Collaboratively energizing my imagination. Collaboratively energizing my imagination. Collaboratively energizing my imagination. Okay, great. Okay, so that's the speed dictation routine. And I'll be asking you periodically to ask your partners, what are you doing now? Okay. Um, the second warm-up is actually a story. I'm going to tell you the story, and then I'm not going to tell the ending of it, and I'll ask you to retell it, okay, and ping-pong with your partners just for a moment, okay? When I was four and five years old, before I went to school, I stayed with my grandmother, because my mother was an elementary school teacher, and she was at school all the time, and my grandmother used to sing this song over and over and over again. And the song went like this. <clears throat> a turtle trying to fly is more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree. Can you try with me? Come on. A turtle trying to fly 
is more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree. Anyways, it became an earworm, and it stuck in my head all the way through school and everything else, and I found myself singing it, but I really didn't know what it meant. Why was a turtle trying to fly more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree? And later in my life, in my late 20s, I got to go back home just a few years before my grandmother passed away, and I asked her, Grandma, why is a turtle trying to fly more beautiful than a bird sitting in a tree? And she said three things. Okay, that's called a split story. Okay, and you have to remind me at the end of this presentation if you want to know what my grandmother said. Okay, <laughs> the idea pedagogically behind that is you get students into a state of curiosity and you teach your regular material. They hold on to it because they're curious, and then you give closure at the end and you finish the story. Okay? But right now, just could you ping pong back and forth and say, once upon a time, Tim had stayed with his grandmother and she sang a song. And tell the story real quick. And if you think you know the answer, go ahead and imagine the answer. Okay? Go ahead with your partners. Retell the story. <laughs> okay, could you ask your partner, what are you doing now? Ask your partner, what are you doing now? <laughs> okay. One more little warm up, and then I'm going to get into the meat of the presentation. Okay. Um, this will really have an impact, I think, on how you understand the rest of the presentation. I need for you to ask each other. Uh, and there's no set answer, it's whatever you think. What do people do to help you have a great day and a meaningful life? Okay? What do people do every day to help you have a great day and a meaningful life? Just ask your partner and brainstorm. Okay? Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, the study about ideal classmates and reciprocal idealizing is actually within a larger study, which we talk about with critical participatory looping. All that means is that a teacher or a researcher, they get information from a group about the group, okay, their opinions or whatever data they have, from a survey perhaps, but they loop it back to the group and they, they might process the information a little bit and give it back and say, does this correct or does it suit you? What do you think about this information? Okay. Um, I started doing this about 20 years ago with action logs where students rated all of the activities we did in class and then they would write comments uh, for every day in their action log. And I would take their comments and put them on a newsletter and give it back to the students. They would read them without their names so they didn't know who was saying what necessarily. But then they got to know what everyone was thinking in the class about that class and those activities. And I realized later that this was, yeah, this was very, very beneficial and looping. I'm going to give you four examples of this that we've done in our studies, okay? And the examples will help you understand it even better, I think. The first example, uh, this was done about four or five years ago in Japan. We asked students um, what did they like and what did they not like about their junior high school and high school education, okay? And we gathered all the data and we made these little charts of likes and dislikes and then we gave it back to the students and we asked them what connections, patterns, or insights do you notice from looking at the data. Now, it was really interesting data for us because grammar was rated number one in the dislikes and grammar was rated number two in the likes. And we saw that it was kind of strange, but we still wanted them to reflect on it. They all protested very loudly, saying, no way do we like grammar. <laughs> okay? And they made us go back and look at the data. And we found out that we had 
conflated likes with usefulness, okay, and we had put it into the same category. They were saying that grammar was useful for the entrance exams and so forth, but that no way did they like it. And once we disambiguated that, we had better data and we could report better things to the students and in our studies. So this is them actually complaining and correcting researchers. Okay? And so this is a really good way to validate your information. If you have information about a group, why not give it back to the group and ask them, does this, does this make sense? Okay? The second example, we asked students, um, how did you get remotivated when you are demotivated? Okay? And at the end of the, the little questionnaire, we asked, what do you think about this survey? And a lot of the students said, please, please, let me know what my classmates are saying. Show us the results. We want to know how other people are getting remotivated. Okay? And it's logical. You might have your own remotivation strategies when you get depressed or something, but it's nice to know what your cohort is doing. Okay? So we took the top 20 ways that they had listed and gave it back to them and asked them again, what do you think of this research? And basically their responses were showing us that they had more hope. They had more uh, passageways to get things done. They had more agency. Okay? And it was a very positive experience. The third example is one that some of you may have already be familiar with. I, this is not from a survey. These are uh, language learning histories. I get my students to write their language learning histories. And I actually publish them in a little booklet. And I give it back to them second semester. And they read them. And I put them into small groups to write uh, reports about them, to do analyses of them, if you like. And they analyze what are the motivational and demotivational factors. And I also ask them to give suggestions to students and to teachers and to the Ministry of Education. And then we put those reports into another little booklet, and we send it to the Ministry of Education. Okay, No response yet. <laughs> uh, but still, we do it. And it's, um, they like it. They like it very much. Um, they also decided uh, in 2010 to actually do a video about this. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So this is the the third loop, if you like, into the video. While I'm getting the video ready, could you please ask your partners, what are you doing now? I'm not going to tell them lies. Reality. Our English learning language histories and the research show that learning English in Japan is not always easy. Many junior high school and high school students in Japan study mainly grammar for entrance exams and end up not being able to use English. After many years of studies, this is the inconvenient truth for that non tatami While most junior high school and high school teachers mean well, and some of our teachers have been really great. The truth is, many teachers are free fulfilling grammar. This is an inconvenient truth. Honne not katemai. A bit of grammar, but the point of need can be useful. But too much is too much. It's boring. We want to talk more. Use English! Talk to our classmates. Sing songs! Give presentations. Write our own ideas. Think seriously about improving our world. In short, do things with language. Not just listen to teachers. Talk in Japanese. When students speak English, we still use grammar. We learn vocabulary. In language learning, use it or lose it. Asking may be a moment's embarrassment. Not asking is lifelong regret. We ask for change. In English education in Japan, for future generations, students want to, want to use English more. Less testing and 
I think our teachers need a break from teaching to exams. We think Mongshu could help by changing the exam systems. Our exam are literally killing some of us. You know, guys, this might not work. It's okay, we can accept failure. But we cannot accept not trying. We dare to hope for a change. Thanks for a great trying to improve education for future generations. I just ran onto another example that I'm going to throw in here real quick that happened way back in 2006 and 7 um, yes. when I was teaching at HPU for the summer, a group dynamics course. Um, and I had a few students who were teaching in the local, one of the local migrant junior high schools, and, uh, and they wanted to do language learning histories. But the students, of course, their English wasn't up to that level. And so what they did was this little booklet. This is the class. Um, and, but basically, each page is just a fill in the blank. I like this. I don't like this, and so forth. And it's telling about the students. And they filled it in. They could make their own drawing, make it personalize it. And they photocopied them, and they put it into a booklet and gave it back to the students. And the students went crazy. They, they were talking about them and asking all the questions. They took them home. Apparently, their parents were learning from it. And so there was lots of really nice feedback about it. So it's getting information from the group, even if it's very, very simple information, but giving it back to them. Not only their own, but their cohort, their class. And later, I'll be talking about how this makes a class more intelligent, okay? more emotionally intelligent as well. Okay. And there's an article in the English Teaching Forum about that that I wrote with my students. Now I'm going to jump to the fourth example, which is uh, what this was advertised as, Ideal Classmates. And um, this started out in last year, uh, one year ago in Boston, 2012. We gave presentations at the AAAL, me and my research group. And Zoltan Dornier came to both of our presentations, and we started kicking around um, terms and ideas about ideal L2 self. Most of you probably know about the ideal L2 self. But we, our team in Tokyo, have always conceptualized that as something that seems very distant. We wanted something more proximal, more close to them. And we were throwing around terms, the ideal L2 class, the ideal L2 group. And finally, we got back. In, and we begin the university year in April. So last year in April, we asked this question. This was the 39th question on a long first, of in, first survey of the year. And we asked them at the last question, please describe a group of classmates that you could learn English well with. What would you all do to help each other learn better and more enjoyably? And we had in six universities in Tokyo, 488 students respond to this. Um, in my own case, I got really, really excited. Uh, with each class, when they turned in their surveys, I immediately went to question 39 because I wanted to read. I was very, very curious about it. And quite honestly, I was in awe. I was going, oh my god, I've got to share this with all the other students. And so I quickly typed everything out, no names, all the comments, and gave it back to them in the next class. And they just started going, wow, this is what my classmates want from me. And I had never thought about doing this, perhaps. And the whole class started resonating much more and gelling, and were just much more intelligent as far as what everybody wanted. At uh, midterm, we had had time to collect all the uh, data, and we put it into 16 descriptors. And I'm going to give those to you now. OK, there you go. Can you take one and pass it back okay. as well? So we coded everything into these 16 descriptors. And at midterm, we actually gave it back to them. And we asked them on a survey basically these three questions about each of these descriptors. Okay? So we asked them on a Likert scale of 1 to 6, this is important for successful learning. Okay? We wanted to know if they thought it was really, really important. And B, my classmates 
have done this so far this semester. So it was at midterm, and they rated on a scale of one to six if their classmates had done it, basically their opinions. And then C, I have done this so far this semester. Okay, and this is really cutting to the chase. Reciprocal idealizing. Um, I need to go back a step. All of you know the golden rule in some religions, uh, most religions I think around the world. They say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, but what we were doing in this, we were flipping it and saying, first of all, what do you want from others? Okay, and maybe that's more logical with egotistical humans, I don't know. Um, but asking them, what do you really want from your classmates? How can they help you? Okay, and but intuitively they started thinking, wow, I want this and this and this, but maybe I should be doing this and this and this. Okay, and that's reciprocal idealizing. Okay, taking it into themselves. I need to be a better, better classmate for my classmates. Okay, so um, let me. This information is all on the back of your handout, by the way. And basically, the means were very, very high. They thought all of the descriptors were very important. They thought their classmates were doing it fairly well, at a scale of four, and that they were doing it as well. And maybe with Japanese humbleness, they were rating their classmates a little bit higher than themselves. Okay? So. And the correlations were also very strong. Um, and this is actually a comment from a student that shows reciprocal idealizing. It says, I could know what is ideal person. Now I will try to be an uh, ideal person. And I'll try to enjoy studying English, talk with my classmates in English more. I think that my motivation becomes high because of this survey. Okay? I would love it if all of our surveys, if we got that, that type of reaction from all of our surveys, where they're actually learning something from the survey. So, okay. So, do all of you know this person? Her Not name personally. is. Huh? Not personally. Not personally? Okay. This is Helen Hunt, and it's in the yeah. movie As Good As It Gets. And um, it's with Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson is a kind of a nerd. All of you are familiar with nerds. <laughs> and, uh, he's out on a date with her, and she's a little bit leery. And Jack Nicholson says, I have a great compliment for you. And she kind of looks wary, and she says, OK, give me the compliment. And he says, this morning, I took my pills. And she looks really confused, and she says, OK, how is that a compliment for me? And he says, ah, you don't understand. I hate taking pills. Doctors have given me pills for years and years and years, and they're just in my closet somewhere. I hate taking pills. I really detest taking pills. And she says, oh, OK, but still, how is that a compliment for me? And finally, he says, well, this morning, I took my pills because you make me want to be a better man. Okay? And she goes into this state of awe and says, wow, that probably is the best compliment I've ever had. For us, this question 39 was the teachers, first of all, went into, ah, oh, wow, this is really, really important. Okay? But then the students also, when they got the feedback and all that they could read what other, everybody else was talking about and wanted, they also felt like they'd suddenly tapped into some sort of truth about what people really wanted and how they could be supported and helped. And it was very, very powerful. So, OK. Um, we presented this at AAAL, and we presented it in terms of dynamic systems theory. And I'm not going to go too deeply into this. Uh, but basically, in dynamic systems theory, getting feedback, biofeedback in the 1960s, uh, but now feedbacks to a system usually makes it more intelligent. Scaling and fractalization, basically, you, you're familiar with fractals, are you? They say that the shape of a leaf, the pattern of a leaf, is the pattern of a branch, and it's the pattern of a tree, and it could be the pattern of a forest underneath that are connected by roots. Okay? So it's something, a pattern that's replicating itself 
at a very small level and up to a very complex level. Um, for a student having motivation or knowing what they wanted, but then knowing what the whole group wants, it's jumping up a scale. And then us reporting this in international conferences, it jumps up scales. Okay? And it can be very, very useful. In the handout, you don't have to look at it now, we suggest possible action research procedures for you on the back. Um, one of the main things that we do suggest, though, is that you start at your fractal level, not to use these 16 codes, because we think students, when they recognize their own comments, when you give that back to them, it shows that they have some sort of agency and input, and it's their, it's their data. Okay? Later, on in, if you want to, you can compare their, their descriptors to these descriptors and have, find different things out. But it's really, if the information comes from them and you can give it back to them, it just seems much more powerful. Okay? Um, this is self-organization, basically, self-organizing agency to a certain extent. Transition states just means going from one state to another. Water, when it freezes, it's not moving molecules anymore. It freezes and it's uh, state change. And our students seem to have gone through a big phase transition in dynamic systems theory. OK, um, I'm going to do what we call openly theorizing now. And this is where I hope to get you into a really nice discussion of things about Cindy's. OK, and I'll explain that. Could you pause for a moment and ask your partner, what are you doing now? First of all, dynamic systems are complex systems. We don't really know how they work all the time. The weather is a dynamic system. And we get information from the weather all the time. We study it in order to try and know how to cope with it. Um, but if you give this information back to the weather, the weather's not going to change. Okay? So it's a dynamic system, but it doesn't benefit from getting any information back to it, at least as far as we know. Okay? But groups of people are what we call socially intelligent dynamic systems. And we regularly get information about our health for example, in our cohorts, and economic information. And we use this, hopefully, to have a better life. Okay? So a class can act as a socially intelligent dynamic system when it is capable of gathering, communicating, and reflecting on data about itself. But from what we know of most teaching situations, it's very rare for a teacher to gather data from the students and give it back to the students. Okay? And that critical participatory looping could be done a lot more. And I think students could learn a lot better with data about themselves. Okay? We also propose that an active Cindy's, okay, a class can act as an active Cindy's when it's capable of interacting with other systems, perhaps other classes, other schools, okay, and you learn from them and you're getting more feedback. Exciting itself into self-synchrony and other system synchrony. Okay? And then agentizing the agents. Okay? Basically, this information is giving them more agency about themselves and allowing them to act upon it, okay? even in the face of diversity. So this is the openly <laughs> theorizing part. Um, what we're proposing is that none of this is good or bad. All of it is good and bad. It's bad, perhaps, if you stay in one place too long. We need a balanced life. All of us need sleep. So when a Cindy's is dormant and passive, when you're sleeping at night, neuroscientists are telling us that that's the time when our brain actually consolidates lots of the information. Okay? So we all need sleep in order to be uh, perky when we're up. <laughs> okay? um, if I start over here, intermental side of the Cindy's, is basically us talking to each other. Okay? And in a moment, I'm going to let you describe this whole chart and talk to your partners about it. Okay? And that will be, I hope, a very intermental moment when you're two, between two minds. Um, these are Vygotskyan concepts, intermental and intramental. Intermental, basically, when I first told you the word Cindy's, perhaps it was new. Okay? And it's this concept up there between minds. Okay? But gradually, once you start using it more and more, you start intramentalizing it. You bring it into yourself. You acquire it, if you like. 
Okay? And then you can use it for your own reflection. Intramental in the Vygotskyan sense means that you're just inside, it's inside, it's you've acquired it. Okay? I'm using it a little bit differently here, just to say that this is a state of being when you're alone. Okay? Because we do know that you learn by yourself and you reflect on things. And there's a wonderful TED.com uh, presentation by Kane on introversion. And she was complaining that too often people uh, had put her into pairs and groups to talk and, and when you don't really need to. And she liked being able to talk and think on her own. Okay? She was an introvert. So each person probably has a preference of a cloud where they're moving around and maybe people, some people are more introverted, some people are more intermental and like to be more social. Uh, some people like to sleep more. <laughs> but basically, I think we need a balance of it in order to be um, healthy. And openly theorizing further, if a lecturer or a teacher talks too long, people start going to sleep naturally. <laughs> you become dormant. And so it's a shame, I think, in classes, especially language classes, for the teacher to be talking all the time. And they need to get students to interact intermentally okay, uh, much, much more. It's a kind of um, a shame to have a whole group together and they're doing intramental type activities, maybe just reading. Why not profit from being together and talking and, and interacting more? And that's my thinking now. Um, let me explain a few of these other things, too. Um, context in person. Right now, you um, have this context, and you might be embedding this into your mind. Uh, later on this afternoon, you might be thinking intramentally about this group and what you've learned here and reflecting on it intramentally. Or you might be telling a friend about it and be going intermental. Okay, and discussing it with someone. Okay, does that make sense? But intramentally, basically, you can you you do put context inside of yourself. Okay, Ushioda talks a lot about um, person in context and being everything situated, but we also carry the context with us. Okay, and we can think about them later on. Imagine Social Capital, Quinn, 2010, is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's not in linguistics, it's in sociology. And she does a lot of research with people out of work in England, or people who drop out of school. And she noticed that they basically were communing with rock stars, or movie stars, or authors, and things like that. It was all imagined Social Capital. So this is an example, if you like, of the context in the person. And Imagining you all could hopefully imagine talking to Einstein or to Freud or to some big name and discussing things with them, okay? And that would be really, really neat, okay? Um, little children do this regularly with their teddy bears and other things. They actually have conversations with them. They have personalities for them, okay? Great. So um, these are continuums from intra to intra, dormant to active. And again, nothing's good or bad. I think if you stay too long in one area, that might get bad. <laughs> you probably need to circulate and move around and to have a, a good balance. So this last slide is kind of tries to put it all together. It's just showing that things can go off kilter, but it's a cycle and you're moving around. And that ecologically and contextually, you're moving and you're balancing multiple needs and influences in chaotic systems, ideally. Another way to look at this is to talk about improvisation. And so life is improvisation to a great extent. So is teaching. We need to pay attention to our environment and see what people need and improvise as best we can. Does that make sense? Yes? OK. So ask your partners, what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> With your partners, could you have a go at explaining this chart? And does it make sense, or would you change anything and everything else? OK, this is your time. Go ahead. <laughs> does it make sense to you?
ideally, I would be able to listen to everybody <laughs> and gather all your information and then give it back to you. Okay? So if you have some reflections on this, I really do invite you to send me an email with your reflections. And whoever sends me an email in the next 48 hours with their reflections, I will send it back to the group who sends me emails. Okay? And then you'll get, and I won't edit anything, <laughs> and then you'll get to hear what other people were talking about, and you'll have an idea of that shared experience, okay? Of that looping, which would be interesting. My grandmother's, uh, what did she say? She said three things, right? She said, relax. And then she said, have a good life. And then she said, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so basically, what she was doing was, she was inviting me to reflect more, I think. And she was giving me agency. She wasn't just telling me the answer. She was keeping me curious. And I honestly believe that all of you will figure it out too. <laughs> so, thank you very much.